Good afternoon. Thank you for being present at this webinar. I'm going to talk about the importance of pilot nidal sins disease that nowadays is still a conundrum after all these years. Maybe you can ask what have to do the, this cobble of myron and virus of Milo or, uh, in a talk about uh, pilonidal sinus disorder. It's probably both the discobal and the venus of Milo's, which such a not so deep cleft wouldn't have suffered of any kind of this pathology. We had to wait till the beginning of the 19th century for seeing in written worlds the um, real definition of what is uh, uh, pilonidal sinus disease. It was described by Mr. Herbert Mayo, who was a fellow of the Royal uh, Society and uh, a surgeon of Middlesex Hospital in, Osp in, in, in at London, that in 1833, in his book Injuries and Disease of Rectum, uh, he describes clearly a new form of uh, anal fistula that instead of going downwards toward the anus, was upward driven in the, the direction of the sacrum. This is the first known description of pilonidal sinus disease. We all know that this entity is a chronic skin infection in the intergluteal crease near the coccyx. It's more frequent in men than in women. Most, of course, from the puberty to till 40 or 50 years of age. And people overweight and with thick hair uh, are more prone to have this kind of disease. The basic mechanics involved in pilonidal sinus disease is that in the cleft, in the intergluteal cleft, with a normal walking, the hair is like the trees in a step, in a steep valley, are forced under the skin. And in response to the hair as a foreign substance, under the skin, the body creates a cyst around the hair, and on uh, because of that, chronic inflammation and infection and drainage occur. So, pilonidal sinus disease has three, four basic components. The first of them is the hair, the second are the pit, and third is the cyst after the induced around the hair under the skin. And there is a tract, an epithelial tract, communicating all these pits that is called the sinus. We see the reference to these points in these two photos. And as we understand, hair is probably the cult because the hair, due to its peculiar surface with scales, once it's under the skin, it can only walk in, uh, in this direction. So, whenever this, the hair goes under the skin, it cannot come back from the same point and it can only walk to, uh, in, in, according to the direction of scales. But the hair, uh, especially after the puberty, the sex hormones affect the pilosebaceous glands and there is an increase in the production of uh, the sebaceous glands and an excess of production of keratin. And so the follicles are swollen by the excess of uh, sebaceous and keratin production. And uh, as they have no drainage outside, the infected follicle ruptures, as we see in this uh, histological cut. And as a result of the rupture of the follicle, we can establish chronic infection in the subcutaneous uh, layers of the skin. Pilonidal sinus disease is really a spectrum that goes from normal follicles, stretched follicle, infected follicle, acute abscess, chronic abscess, and at least but not last at the epithelial tube. So the disease is really a spectrum 
with a, some kind of progression in it. Pylonidal sinus disease, according to Bascom and Bascom hypothesis, uh, is this uh, evolution from normal follicles to stretched follicles, infected follicles, and so on. And this is hypothesis is that the cyst, when the patient is standing, it is, uh, produces a suction of the hair inside the cyst. Whenever the patient sits, he squeezes out the cyst, and this is one of the causes of the rupture of the, the cyst. So the exact cause of the pylonidal sinus is, uh, is not clear. In, in the late 50s, uh, there was a theory that the, the cause of sacrococcygeal, uh, uh, of sacro, um, pylonidal sinus disease was caused by a sacrococcygeal dimple. But uh, as we know, all pediatric surgeons, sacrococcygeal dimple is as frequent as simple. It's normal for me to see two or three cases per week uh, of this uh, light um, depression uh, on the intergluteal cleft. Uh, when, what we know is that congenital tracts of this area do not contain hair and are lined only with cuboidal epithelium. That's the result of the normal primary neurulation of the um, posterior pole of the central nervous system. So if you look at here, it's the neural class cells that produce, uh, they fuse in the middle line when the neurulation does. And these cells are cuboidal and not uh, producing hair. Even so, we have some enigmatic sacrococcygeal dimples that may explain the existence of spinal dysrophism that occurs in one in 2,500 birds. And so we recommend using of NMR, uh, MRI uh, studies of the sacral dimple whenever it is longer than five millimeters, more than 25 millimeters above the anus, it's covered with hair or with other cutaneous stigmata in order to discover really spinal dysrophism. One other conundrum about a pediatrics, uh, about pylonidal sinus disease is the need that we feel that uh, a practical classification system should guide our uh, practice. Uh, in this meta-analysis systematic review of several classification proposed, we see that all of them have uh, similar uh, data, but they are interpreted, interpreted uh, they are um, observed in different ways. One of the earliest ones was proposed by Tesel in 2007. It's a score of five types. In first, in type one, there are only pits. In type two, it's an abscess. I type three, it's several pits with a, a, a drainage. Type four is with a large drainage uh, and type four, five is the recurrence. What uh, is important to say is that the uh, advice for type one is exclusively hygiene. And the hygiene is one of the less and the more forgotten words when we explain this pathology to our patients, especially in young adolescents, because hygiene is a Greek noun that describes conditions and practices conductive to maintaining health and preventing disease, especially to cleanliness. And cleanliness is not what uh, many patients do. And that's one of the causes of the huge incidence of this disorder in uh, adolescents. The most recent uh, classification proposed by Gunner in 2016, uh, as usual, these uh, classification, these proposals are done by colleagues from uh, countries like Turkey that have huge experience about treating this disease. It, it's also uh, five stages. It's more uh, easy learned looking at the images. Uh, stage one is a single pit. Uh, stage two are more than one pit. Uh, stage three are uh, multiple pits. Stage three is um, a pit with drainage on only one side. Stage four is, is multiple pits with drainage on both sides of the cleft. And stage R is for um, recurrence of the disease. 
before talking about the different treatment options, I must perform a statement according to Monsieur Voltaire. Common sense is not, uh, uh, it's not so common. It's really uncommon, as he said. One of the statements that we must define is that, as Mr. Peter Lord and Douglas Miller in 1965 said, all fistulas will heal if they are not kept open. This is common sense. But in pylonidal sinus, is, uh, the foreign body is hair. And this is air is the foreign body under the skin. If air is removed, the fistula will heal. So I advise my patients to perform laser epilation of the area, not shaving. I can discuss why not. Uh, shaving, but uh, it, there is evidence published in general pediatric surgery that describes that laser depilation is the best solution. The treatment options uh, uh, admitted in National Health Service, beside minor operations like drainage of, uh, of the abscess, are uh, removal of the cyst with or without closing of the skin and procedures tend uh, to clean sinus and encourage, uh, encourage is healing. So everybody knows the wide excision of the lesion <coughs> with open technique versus immediate closure of the lesion with or less uh, vacuum assisted closure. Very recently has been published a paper by plastic surgeons advising the wide excision and immediate negative pressure therapy uh, with the primary closure even with this extensive excision. What's the, the major advantage of this? This decreases the pain in the post-operative uh, period, in the immediate post-operative period, and decreases the decence of the suture. Uh, since uh, 70, 1973, Mr. Karidakis described the half midline closure of the excision. This is a relatively simple operation to perform. I've done it sometimes. But uh, from some time now, uh, I, I usually used Bascom cleft lift technique, in which this is not an easy technique to learn because the development of the medial flap, it's not easy to learn. Uh, and especially the, the way we suture deep suture of, of, of the flap off midline. And last but not least, the proposed Lindbergh transposition flap described since 1946 with this uh, plastic surgeon who described this flap for every uh, rhomboid lesions. But as Mr. the great Leonardo said, if simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, we must look at simpler methods and simple techniques to treat these patients. The first was described in 1965 by Mr. Lord and Mr. Miller, as I said, if there is no air, there is no fistula. It's very simple, can be performed using a punch biopsy device like this, or I'm going to show you further in the direct surgery the way we do it. And this is very simple procedure, no air, no fistula. Some years ago was described sealing the sinus with fibrin glue versus promoting the phenolization of the tract. Uh, I have no experience of the finalization of the tracks, but I have tried a couple of times with fibrin glue. This is very good if there was no uh, earlier infection. Uh, in, in a couple of times I've used this. In one of the cases I had a severe immediate post-operative infection that was mandatory to, to perform the drainage of the pus. <clears throat> and more recently, in 2014, Mr. Meinero, described the FC technique. This is a very precise technique. All the steps must not uh, left apart. So here are a description of technique using the fistuloscope or a cystoscope, a pediatric cystoscope. I'm going to show you why. We use high pressure pre uh, injection of fluid in the fistula and we proceed to looking at the fistula, clipping the hair inside, cleaning all the tissues and then seal it with electrocoagulation. This is a recent publication of data in application of this technique in pediatric patients published in uh, Brazil some weeks ago. 
by Mr. José Sapucaia Filho, and he demonstrates that even in younger children, in younger adolescents, this has very good results. In uh, 2017, uh, this uh, uh, um, Belgian uh, surgeon described the laser ablation of the tract using a radial fiber of, um, uh, of laser. Um, this was also done by other colleagues with same good results. And what I advise my patients is what I call the better together technique in which besides pit picking, I proceed to the look, clip and clean of the track with the fistula scope. And at the end, I seal the track with the radiant fiber of laser. What about recurrence? This is one of the largest studies I have known. More than 50,000 patients were enrolled. And if we look at 12 months follow-up, we see that many of the techniques have uh, recurrence rates under 1 to 5%. Uh, and best results are with primary asymmetric closure, Bascom Karidakis, Lundberg, and so on. And there is already some experience with laser. But if we look at five years follow-up, we see whatever the, the, the technique, the recurrence goes up to the range between 5 and 25%. So, <clears throat> as a sort of conclusion, I, I can say that, as we know, many surgeons still perform uh, a wide excision of the cyst with uh, lay open healing or primary closure. These are techniques that are easy techniques to learn. Current evidence supports that off midline. Uh, techniques are better because of lower recurrence and minimally invasive techniques are becoming increasingly popular in outpatient, as a, an outpatient procedures. These processes, uh, these procedures are technically simple and patient's satisfaction is high. But why that? Because they are almost painless and very early there is a recovery of everyday activities with this kind of surgery. Uh, as a surgeon and fistula are becoming more popular and as a mind personal conclusion on long term recurrence is taken for granted in 5 to 25 percent of the cases so i earlier choose the less bothering options for my patients even if not the cheaper because techniques uh, these techniques are not cheap uh, are not uh, are a little expensive for, for for patients okay so Again, thank you, Dr. Paulo Casella, for your, your fantastic presentation. I, I really learned a lot with this presentation. Um, and just before going to the next one, uh, I, I, I don't want to make a comment right now, but, but I, I would like to make the, the audience think a little bit of, of just two, two, two points. Uh, I think one of them is that, that was, was talked in this presentation is the importance of staging. I think, uh, just think a little bit, if you, if you really change, with, particularly when we are talking on laser therapy, if you change your, your, your surgery according to, to the staging or not, um, because this is very important. And I think if you read most of the papers uh, about sinus and laser, uh, one of the handicaps is really that we, we don't know what we are comparing. Yeah, so this is one, uh, one of the, the points that I would like to, to make you think about for the, 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 the final discussion. Well, the other comment is about money. Uh, what's more expensive, uh, one shot, one fiber, or uh, a patient coming for three to six months to the clinic to, to change dressings and uh, avoiding work and everything. Uh, if you compare apples with apples, I think this is, laser will be much more uh, much less expensive than than the classical the classical treatments.